today is a true innovator of marketing and a master storyteller and one of the absolute most down-to-earth leaders I've ever had the pleasure of speaking with. Please welcome Google's Director of Storytelling for Google Cloud, Natalie Lambert to the show. Natalie, are you ready to get radically transparent with me? I am. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> We are really excited to have you. Um, and I, you know, I have done my due diligence and I have to say your LinkedIn profile may have intimidated me just a little bit because it's that impressive. Um, but you know, there's something I think about storytelling that, that LinkedIn just, the profile is not gonna give you. So I'd love to start off the show by asking if perhaps I could hear from the woman herself um, a little bit about how you found yourself at Google and perhaps a little bit of a look back on your professional journey uh, before you were there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I lucked out uh, in early in my career. I was a computer science major and uh, happened to kind of fall into a, a role at Forrester Research. Uh, so for those of you who know Forrester, it's an analyst firm and I was a research associate. I, I came up through the ranks, but one of the things that was amazing about that role is being able to talk to IT folks, people who were using various technologies to understand their pain and to understand what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, and my role was to give them advice on the technologies out there and how they should be thinking about all the different emerging technologies. And, um, you know, that role as a first role out of college to be able to learn how to walk a mile in the customer's shoes and understand their pain and what they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis is something is something experience can't buy. Like you have you have to you have to do that. And I think, you know, being able to understand those pains gave me the ability to work with vendors around their messaging and the way they told stories about their products because I was day in, day out spending time with the largest enterprises in the world as they were struggling, which in, in the case that of the technologies I covered was end user computing. So okay. struggling with how do we make employees productive? How do we you know, do it in a secure way and being able to talk about all the technologies there. Um, and that's ultimately what led me to Citrix. Uh, Citrix was one of the companies that I enjoyed working with most. They were just fun. I love the people culture so important to me. So to be able to translate the, the pain that customers felt and be able to bring that into a marketing role was really interesting to me because I had a, a different way of writing about challenges, writing about pain, writing about the way our technology solved problems because I had spent seven years with those customers on a day to day basis. So, you know, that's what got me into marketing. I did a wide variety of roles within Citrix. Um, the one that's probably uh, pinnacle for me, um, actually two. <laughs> one was when I moved into a role uh, where we were starting this brand new mobility solution. Okay. And the reason why that was so pivotal is that it was a product that no one cared about <laughs> within Citrix. And what that, and the reason why that matters is because it was one that we had to then do all of our own, you know, marketing campaign, sales enablement, because the system of Citrix didn't want to help us yet because there was no revenue tied to that product. Um, so I got that dip of the startup experience while in the safety of a big company. Uh, so that was one really great point. And the second one was I was tasked at the very end of my time at Citrix to build a platform product marketing role to say, what is Citrix all what, what, how do we talk about ourselves? You know, instead of being a set of misfit toys, how can we tell a unified story that made it all come together? And so building that market and telling those stories to companies was huge. And then, you know, everything kind of progressed from there. That work led me to a startup. And, you know, I knew I wanted to do a startup because of that great experience at the mobility side of, of uh, Citrix. And then that one was acquired back to Citrix. <laughs> so I decided not to go uh, and do something else spent time again at another startup in a completely different area this time slightly bigger being able to again tell different stories and that one was acquired and um all of a sudden there was this role at google that for storytelling and for doing this across all the various channels the blog thought leadership uh, campaign assets social media 
And I was given that that was what I enjoyed most versus, you know, being a CMO, you kind of dip your toe in everything, uh, which is what I did at the startups. I was, I was ready to go back to my roots. And so that's what brought me to Google. And I'm so thrilled to be here. That's <laughs> fantastic. Uh-huh. And it's, it's quite a story too. I can't imagine, you know, being fresh out of college, getting a job at Forrester and I mean, that's really impressive. And then have like fresh out of college consulting and analyzing and working with, um, you know, end users and, and different technology vendors. That, that's really something. So to come on quite a journey, I think that must. Have yeah, been- it was. And I will say one of the things that's interesting is, you know, I didn't jump into the consulting part out of college. You know, I was a, a lowly research associate. But <laughs> what made that role so interesting is that we were responsible for the primary data for the analysts. So I was the one doing the cold calls, you know, to try to get somebody to answer 10 questions around their struggles. And it's amazing how A, just it's it's grueling work, but B, what you learn in doing that and actually talking to these people um, because they, they tell you all their pains, they tell you where they're struggling and to be able to bring that back up to the analysts, I think helped me immensely. Absolutely, the boots on the ground and really being in that front line. Exactly. Which kind of leads me to ask you, I mean, you know, you, you come from this data-driven background, you're a fantastic storyteller. What, I mean, and those two things sometimes as marketers, I think it kind of is tough, right? How do you use the data to tell a story? How do you tell a story with the data? But what is keeping you up at night professionally these days in terms of your role or in terms of the world we now wish live? Yeah, I, I have two things. I think we'll we'll dive into one of them much more on this this call. But two things. Um, one, and I, I don't want to call this the simple one, but it's where I'll spend less time on this. Mm-hmm. Just keeping and hiring and retaining the best team, people. You know, right now uh, it is it is an employees market, and making sure that you know your employees are are satisfied in their work. Uh, and and they're happy and they they want to be doing this and doing the best for the company. So that's one. But it actually kind of goes into number two, which is measurement. Um, understanding the impact of all of the various things we do. And it is so hard right now to to quantify how certain content, especially top of the funnel type things, impact going down the funnel. I mean, even, you know, I, I think about this podcast, and, you know, it's fantastic that you're doing, but it's like, how do you quantify all of that? And, you know, when I think about kind of keeping the team happy and, and measurement, they go on in hand in hand because, you know, employees want to know they're making a difference. They want to know that they're, that they're bringing impact and they're doing all of that. And when it's so hard to quantify, you know, you can you can get into a swirl of does what I do even matter? And, uh, you know, I think it's those two things that that definitely have me struggle. <laughs> I, I, I'm like smiling big for anyone listening in on the, on the YouTube channel here. Um, I'm smiling big because part of my role is bringing in, you know, that top of funnel content. And I can tell you firsthand it's not easy at the end of the day, the end of the month, the end of the quarter, even the end of the year, right? So to put right. to see how what in what is your impact in numbers, um, and mm-hmm. I want to ask, you know, in your opinion, why and what do you think makes this measurement and marketing so challenging to understand? Because at the end of the day, it's like there has to be some way that we can track this back, and why why is this so hard? Yeah. I'll simplify it by putting it into two categories, but as everyone knows, each category can probably be blown up into 15 on their own. Um, But one is that content. I don't care the content. This podcast, a a, a campaign asset, a tweet, they are all individual pieces in a long journey. And to say, we don't have the ability, generally speaking, to say that that one podcast, that one tweet, that one piece of content led to X pipeline. It's generally this web page. I listened to a podcast. I forgot about you and went to another vendor. I then read this asset. I then, you know, you, you go through and it's, it's like these peaks and valleys. And so how do you measure something that you don't know if it even participated in the decision for the customer? to consider you as a vendor. Um, So that's just the breadth 
problem and and too many I don't want to say too many cooks in the kitchen it's the wrong expression but there's too many things that part that 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 are there that you have to attribute to what potentially got somebody to become an, a true sales lead the second is that each of these places on the journey has associated data with it you know how much it costs to create uh, did if you, it was a white paper, did we go to an external vendor to do it? Did we write it internally? Um, how about how are we marketing and distributing that piece of content? Is it being done through content syndication? Is it being done just simply on the website? Every single time you spend, it's a different line item. And generally, especially at a large company, each of those decisions is being made by a different team. How do you bring this all together and correlate all the kind of the spend associated with it combined with where this fit on the journey and spit out a number that says, this is the impact of this content. And um, I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> like we have not, you know, we've not figured out the silver bullet and, you know, conversations that we have internally is, you know, should it be, you know, should we judge our success based on the number of inquiries we brought in? Should we judge our success based on the pipeline it generated? I mean, the reality is, as I, as I said, like no one tweet is going to drive pipeline in and of itself. So where do you draw those lines? And I think that there are so many different pieces of this that, and, and, and I don't think there's an established, this is how you do it. And uh, until then, until we can have all of our data together in these one places, um, it's just really, really hard. And uh, I'm on a journey here, no doubt. I, I think it's really interesting that you bring that up because also when I think about marketing, what you're talking about, kind of finding that one number, and maybe this is a challenge to our audience to start, maybe we can collaborate, start collaborate, collaborating on working on this. But it's interesting if you like look at the role of an accountant, for example, or some other mm -hmm. professions out there where there's kind of like the right way to do things or like a handbook or yes. official kind of like you can get certified, right? You can actually get certified to become a certain mm -hmm. expert on something. And what's interesting when it comes to measuring and marketing and all these things, there are classes you can take and certifications you can gain. But at the end of the day, there's no set way to achieve these different metrics or measurements and it's not the same at each company so i think that that's Correct. really interesting as well you know when we look at the even the employees market right it's so like where you might excel in one role or company and how they measure or how they do things you know it might not be the same at every place and should there right mm -hmm. should there be a standard or or not yeah right? i mean i, I yeah, no, like I, I have, I have no ear, uh, answers, and I'm sure that was just you know more a question for the ether. But it's like I think every every company just looks at it differently, and um, they they have different sales cycles. I mean, some things are easier, some things you can buy online really quickly, and you know maybe there is a world in which I you know especially in the consumer world, you know I read about some product and I go buy it. You know there are some things that are easier. I can tell you in in enterprise B two B tech where sales cycles can be a year. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of touch points, yeah. and so uh, I, I I just don't see a world in which we can get to some some you know, I think there should be some best practices, but I've yet to fully see them, to be honest. <laughs> so, so we'll keep our eyes out, and we'll have to come together maybe to create some. Which actually leads me into my next question, which probably isn't going to be any easier, um, because you know I think one of the biggest buzzwords, trends, especially on LinkedIn that we're seeing right now, is the topic of thought leadership and building your brand as a thought leader and building your employees and placing them as thought leaders. And I think a lot of B two B brands and marketers and even sales, we absolutely know it works when you are talking about different types of thought leadership work and content. But in your opinion or in your experience, what are some of the ways that you're measuring thought leadership, if at all? I, I put this in the same category, unfortunately. So for example, um, we're doing, there's a few things we're doing. So first, you know, we're doing a lot of thought leadership uh, through my team, uh, through, you know, you purchase it, you know, the pay to play. Forbes content, you know, and, and doing and doing that. And, and how we look at that is how many eyeballs are we getting on it? We're measuring it that way. Okay. We're also measuring what is the click-through rate to our site. If we have created something interesting 
and we do a good job of putting related information, we can bring people in. You know, so are we growing that pie of people who look and then are we sending them to the site? Um, now, those are things that I can more control. Um, we also uh, are trying to centralize thought leadership as much as possible. Um, as you can imagine, to your point, you said, you know, people are trying to be thought leaders and it's all on LinkedIn. We have a huge community who have their own kind of medium channels and, and LinkedIn channels because they want that voice to be theirs and associated with them, but they have a lot of really great things to say. How can we convince them to bring that content onto our channels? Um, so those are programs that we're doing as well. Um, so that one's less about measurement, but but again, if you grow the pie of things that you're talking about uh, and, and saying and the voices being heard, you'll bring more people in and then you start to monitor how many people come to the site. You know, that's that's one of the biggest things that we're doing from a thought leadership I, to, to tie that, uh, especially when, you know, all of the GDPR and the ability to cookie, like we can't do any of that. So to us, it's, it's you come to the site or you didn't, our journey kind of ends there from what we can track. And so uh, we just want to hope that that number keeps getting better, that we are creating content that is engaging people enough to want to come learn more on the site. I think that's interesting, and, and you know, that kind of it leads me into a social question. And you may not have the answer, and that's totally fine. But do you think there's a correlation between, so for example, um, CEOs, CMOs, VPs on social, for anyone doing or engaging in thought leadership, do you think that there's a correlation between follower growth and thought leadership in terms of your company pages across social media? And if so. Could, have you seen or, or tried different ways to measure that? I know it goes back to our like kind of original opening of like, how, like there's a lot of different touch points that can contribute to that. Mm -hmm. But I think what I'm really curious about is kind of that if, if I'm, let's say, um, consulting with my CEO and I'm saying, listen, let's get you out there as a thought leader. And then I'm making this assumption that that's going to help grow, let's say, Octopost's LinkedIn page. Mm -hmm. That's a correlation to be made and can be measured. So I can't answer that question, but I can answer one that's very closely tied. Okay. There is no doubt, and I'm going to speak a little outside of my shoes, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to tell you what I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, people are bigger than brands. All the social algorithms, that is the one true statement. And so when you are posting to the company channels, you're only going to get 1% or so of people who follow you to see that content. People are different. People see significantly more, how do I phrase this? More people see other people's posts than they do brands. So one of the things that we've learned um, is that we, if we start promoting content, mm -hmm. so an executive does do either a piece of that leadership or is pointing to something, we can get significantly lower um, uh, cost per click, mm -hmm. engage, whatever metrics we've chosen mm -hmm. when amplifying a person mm -hmm. versus a brand. Okay. So we have seen massive differences. So I know this isn't in the answering the question. However, what I can tell you is if you have $5,000 to spend, do you put it behind a brand or do you put it behind a person? The person will get you better results every day. Yep. And so, so, so in some cases, yes, I think the per the person will drive more. Um, but that is how we're looking at that difference. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. And, uh, it's a good segue it's transitioning, you know, mm -hmm. talking about the person and the people over the mm -hmm. brand. Um, so I know, you know, 2020, 2021 work, life, home, life, all combined into one life, right? It's, it's shifted. And I'm curious to ask, you know, as a marketing leader, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier as one of the things that does keep you up at night, how are you keeping your teams happy? And you would think, you know, I was actually surprised to hear you say that, especially as someone coming from Google, which so many right. of us on the outside are like, Google, they have everything and, you know, the happiest employees. 
you know, mm -hmm. campuses. I mean, it's like the dream that we all hear about. Right. How are you continuing to motivate and innovate and keep your best people at Google? Yeah, no, totally makes sense. And I, I'll first say, I actually started during COVID. So I've never gotten to go to the office before. <laughs> so all of those benefits, you know, and so I actually have to kind of treat my empl employees. Like, I don't know what they're used to which is kind of putting me at a disadvantage at, at, at as well. Um, but what we've all learned this year, I mean, COVID and all of the social uh, things that have happened, especially in the United States this year, um, be a person, be a human first. Um, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. I think that, you know, too often, you know, people have a company line that they have to take or, you know, they, they have to behave in a, in a way um, and uh, or say the right thing, et cetera, et cetera. And I think too many leaders get stuck in that when situations come up. Um, I have found you be a person <laughs> like you, 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 you sit there and you, you listen and, you know, be an ear, ask questions as the, the case may be. But I think in so many cases, especially this past year, people want to be heard. Um, and I think you do that by being a person. Um, but in terms of kind of my management philosophy, it's always about trust and transparency. Okay. You know, um, you have to build trust with your team. You have to be a person that they come to when they're struggling with something, when they want to, to talk about something that they don't want, either escalate, whatever direction it might be, be um, but create a set of trust. A, a, a prove that you are there to help and support them. Even it, it makes giving the tough conversations um, better. So I actually fell in love with the name of this podcast because uh, radically candor is one of my favorite thing concepts. And I, I definitely made my team kind of listen to the whole Kim Scott video for 20 minutes before we did our very first reviews, because it's, you know, I, I think we just, we need to learn how to take feedback, give feedback and all that in, in every which direction, um, but you can't do that without trust. Uh, and so that's number one. And then two, um, I am transparent to a fault. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I hate to admit that, you know, publicly, but, but I, I do believe that when your team knows what's happening, you can all row in that same boat together. Um, I think the worst thing that can happen is, you know, when you, you kind of, there's, there's things you're not supposed to talk about or whatever. And so you're just having team people and folks do things that you know might never get used, you know? And I think you have to balance a fine line, no doubt, but to the extent that you can keep people informed so that they can do their best work for you, uh, I think is, is so important. So when you talk about keeping employees happy and, and kind of what we talked about at the beginning about keeping, uh, keeping them in seat and things like that, you know, that transparency comes back to things like, you know, is the work that they're doing impactful? And, and because they get frustrated when it's not. And so if you can make sure that they're not working on useless projects because of some political thing that you can't talk about, you know, it, it, that transparency plays a huge part in that. And so I think trust and transparency have always been my two, my two tools um, for the teams that, that I've built. We love that trust and transparency. It's where the name of our podcast actually came about at Octopus. We are also huh. strong believers that radical transparency in teams really brings out the best in everyone uh, and even some not, not so easy conversations, but as long as you're uh, right. radically transparent. So I really thank you for joining the show today. I have one last question for you. And, uh, you know, I think you shared a lot with us about things that we wouldn't know on your LinkedIn profile, and you really took some time to get radically transparent with us. Um, and I'm hoping you might be able to tell us something about yourself that we couldn't find out if we Googled you or if we looked at your LinkedIn profile and someone could only learn from this podcast. Um. This would take some digging. You might be able to find it, but it would take some serious digging. <laughs> so I'll do this. Whole years. We're in. Yes, yeah. I um I started life as a ballet dancer. Um, and that really was my uh first kind of foray into the professional world in high school. Um, because that's where uh those that's the age in which you know you make that transition to the professional world. And, um, you know, I will say that my kind of dedication, persistence, um, being able to take and give feedback 
all come from that pro professional career um, that happened before I even graduated high school. And, uh, I, you know, it was that that enabled me to um, kind of push forward in a computer science degree, kind of live in a, I mean, we were all a male dominated world. And to be able to do that and just kind of push through and per persevere because uh, the per percentage wise, I mean, dancing, the, to get there, it might not be the same gender uh, percentages, but it's just as hard to make your way up. And um, I, I give that a lot of credit. And I, you know, just to end that, uh, I, I had a professional contract, but my got stress, stress fracture in my back oh, no. and it all ended right before I started. Wow. So uh, it was, I don't, I don't even know what to say. That was a lesson in self um, control as well, just being able to deal with the heartache of that. Um, but it was great to, to go through that and, and then be able to persevere on to do something else. Listen, to get a professional contract in ballet is no easy feat. Um, so <laughs> congratulations many years later. It's still something to be super proud of. Uh, do you still dance today or, or you know, recreationally or no, no, it's a... Um, no, uh, you know, if I'm out at a party, I maybe was the first on the dance floor, but not in any uh, capacity that somebody would say, oh, she used to be a dancer. <laughs> like that's not there. <laughs> Oh man, well Natalie, listen, um, thank you so much for sharing everything you shared. And I have the utmost respect for ballerinas everywhere. Um, I know it's a very grueling and rewarding world. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, if anyone Absolutely. listening in wants to connect with you, maybe chat more about storytelling or uh, retaining employees, where can they reach you? Yeah, so LinkedIn, so backslash Natalie Lambert. And then on Twitter, uh, at an F Lambert. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah. Natalie, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jen. Thanks for tuning in to the Radically Transparent podcast brought to you by Octopost, the only social media management and employee advocacy platform architected for B2B. I'm Jennifer Gutman, your host and director of social strategy here at Octopost. And if you love today's show, we'd love if you subscribe, rate, and give a raving review wherever you get your podcasts. For more discussion on B2B social media marketing, be sure to follow Octopost on LinkedIn. And of course, to gain access to all our free social media marketing and employee advocacy resources, head on over to our website, www.octopost.com. Until next time.